All right, for question number nine, we're going to be looking at the uh, light list here. And it says that there's a lighthouse with a nominal range of 14 miles and it's 26 feet high. It gives you the visibility of four miles and your height of eye. And it's asking you what range you're going to see this light at. Well, for this, we're going to be looking at solving a, um, a visibility of lights problem. And here's your strategy for this. Um, once again, we're just kind of solving this problem with a quick explanation. If you need a, a, a beginner course on this, there's other videos out there for that. But there's kind of two things you need to do. One is determine the geographic range. And that is kind of how far you could see a lighthouse based on the distance to the horizon. You know, if you're way over here, your height and its height is the theoretical maximum distance you could see in perfect visibility. And then the second thing is the luminous range. And that is based on uh, two things, the intensity of the light and the um, existing meteorological visibility. Right? This is otherwise known as nominal range, right there, the intensity of the light. So think of a couple things here. The geographic range, you should think like, um, imagine there's no atmosphere and you're really just limited by the curvature of the earth. For this one, the luminous range, think about um, how the intensity of the light interacts with the, the fogginess or the cloudiness or the state of the atmosphere. For instance, on a foggy day, you can see headlights from a car because those headlights are really powerful. But if you had a very weak light, it wouldn't matter what kind of visibility you have um, you're not going to see it at a long distance. So we need to kind of find both of these and then whichever is less is going to be our answer. All right. So let's write down the information from the problem. The uh, light itself, it didn't give a name. It just said it had a nominal range of uh, 14 nautical miles and it had a height of 26 feet and then some other information out there um, you had a height of uh, 20 feet and then the visibility was four nautical miles so in essence I wrote it this way because um, we're gonna take a look at this height and this height and we're gonna come up with that geographic range right there the way to do that is in the light list. There's uh, the table for geographic range. There's also one in Bowditch, but all the Coast Guard problems are written based on this table. And so right here, you kind of look up in feet or meters, and then it computes the uh, distance to the horizon for you. There's some explanatory stuff in an example here, but basically, you know, for instance, for us, we've got a height of 20 feet. So if we look at 20 feet, that means we have a distance to the horizon of 5.2 nautical miles. All right. And then the lighthouse itself had a height of 26 feet. Now that's not exactly listed, right? So it's um, somewhere between 25 and 30 and somewhere between 5.9 and 6.4 um, right there, right? So if we're at 26, we're pretty close to the 25. So what if we said 6.0 as a rough approximation for that? And then the geographic range then is the combination of these two here. So that would be 11.2 nautical miles for the geographic range. So that's part one to the problem. Part two is taking a look at the nominal range and the visibility to calculate the luminous range in here. And then whichever one of these two is less is going to be our final answer. So on the very next page in the light list is the luminous range diagram. It's not a very good diagram, but you should read the instructions. Um, also down here, it's got a couple of cautions. It says the ranges are approximate. The atmosphere can vary. The rolling motion of your ship can vary. So this uh, is purposefully designed to be approximate. You're not going to, don't worry about like to the nearest half a mile kind of visibility. All the problems are going to be based on this diagram and it's all approximate. So what we need to do is we need to enter this table with the nominal range. That's the range that you could see um, a light given average meteorological visibility of 10 miles. And so our nominal range was 14. So if we start down here at the 14, we're going to go up in the diagram until we come across the visibility of four miles. Now you'll notice in here the visibility curves 
200 yards, 500 yards, 1,000, one mile, two, 5.5. So we're somewhere between the two and the 5.5 nautical miles. So if we come up the 14, and say we stop at the two curve, right? That means our luminous range is 90 degrees from that. It's over here. So it's gonna be something like 4.5 if our visibility was two. And if our visibility was 5.5, we come up the 14, stop there, and it's like eight and a half, right? So somewhere between, you know, the, the four and the, the uh, eight and a half should be our visibility. So if you look at the problem, you know, there's only one answer that falls in there, so that is helpful. But if we wanted to approximate exactly what we're getting, we'll start at the 14, come up and see where we would land for like four miles of visibility. And it's gonna be somewhere in here, somewhere between the two and the 5.5 curve. So we come straight over and it's gonna be about seven nautical miles. So that's what I would say, seven nautical miles, right? So that's our answer there. Whichever of, the, of these two is less is gonna be our final answer for the problem. So by computing it, I think our visibility for this light is gonna be seven nautical miles. Looking at the answers, we've got choices of seven and a half, nine point six, and and higher up. The fourteen was the geographic range, so that's clearly incorrect. And then we said we were somewhere between like nine and four and a half, um, given our bracketing values for the visibility in the book. And then our best guess was seven. So I would go for choice A, seven point five. Remembering that key phrase in the uh, light list down here for the table that these ranges are approximate. For number 10, it's a trivia question regarding oceanography. It says, on mid-ocean waters, the height of a wind-generated wave is not affected by which of the following? Well, the best way to answer this is to say, what does affect wind-generated waves? And what do we mean by wind-generated? We're not talking about tsunamis or earthquakes or anything like that. We're talking about the wind blowing on the surface of the sea. So let's take a look at Bowditch in the oceanography section. And if you wanted, you could kind of look in the index for fetch, if that's a word you're not familiar with, and that'll actually guide you to the, to the right spot. Uh, so under wave characteristics, there's a nice sentence in here that says, um, wave height, length, and period depend on a number of factors, such as the wind speed, the length, it uh, length of time it takes to blow, and its fetch. The fetch is the straight distance that has traveled over the surface. So in essence, it's the distance that a wind is blowing over the surface of the sea. So given what Bowditch says, it does depend on fetch, it does depend on velocity, and it does depend on the duration. And those three factors are what's gonna go into what's called a fully developed C diagram. And there's a nice website I'll link to here at the University of Hawaii Manoa, where they talk about um, C state and they give a couple examples, but the maximum theoretical height of a wave is generated by fetch, velocity, and duration of the wind. So our choice here is uh, B, it's the answer that is not affected. So for number 11 here, mean high water is used for what? Mean high water is what's called a datum. Uh, that's D-A-T-U-M. And it's kind of a chart reference. So some charts are gonna be based on things like low water or high water or um, kind of your averages given uh, over time in a general location. So here's an example. So if this red line is the tide over the course of a couple days, it kind of goes up and goes down. And depending where you live in the world, there's gonna be different highs and different lows. Some of the highs are gonna be really high. Some of the highs are just gonna be kind of average. Some of the lows are gonna be really low and some will be just a little bit kind of just average. So if you were to take the average of all the high tides right there, right? So say it was like something like that that's gonna be mean high water, the average of the high waters. The other thing you might see is like something called mean higher high water, MHHW, and that's just, you know, these. So if you just took the biggest tides over the course of a period, that might be that one. What you're more familiar with probably is if you averaged out all the lows, you know, the big ones and the little ones, you might get mean low water. And then if you took just the lowest ones and averaged them out, you'll get mean lower low water, MLW. This is what most chart datums are in the United States, mean lower low water. It's the lowest of the lows. Um, and so that allows you some flexibility when you're driving your ship over a chart. If you see 126 feet, you know that's pretty much as shallow as it's ever gonna get. It's usually gonna be more than that.
right? So it's a safety margin built in there. Well, in this case, we're talking about high water. And so most charts are not based on high water. If we're trying to be cautious about things, if the whole point of choosing the lowest of the lows was to be cautious and make sure mariners don't uh, get in trouble, when might high water be useful? Well, if you're uh, kind of passing under a bridge, right? If you look at your chart and it says mean lower low water, that's not super useful to you, right? You wanna know really when mean higher high water is so that you have a safety margin. So that if you go through at mean higher high water, you know, that one chance in a million that you're gonna be at the highest point, you wanna know what the absolute safest margin is for you to clear through. So this is kind of a long story to answer this question. I just wanted to explain the difference. Most people don't see mean higher high water. They see this on charts. This is sometimes used, for instance, going under bridges, um, and then the answer to this question is to indicate the shoreline where there's a large tidal fluctuation. So going back to that theme of being cautious, if you've got a shoreline you know, with a large tidal fluctuation, it's probably safer to show where the shoreline is at higher high water so that you've got some margin for error in there, um, cartography speaking, right? But uh, depths and stuff are usually mean lower low water. So looking at the other examples, is it used as a reference in the Gulf? or used as a reference for bottom contour lines, or used kind of as a reference, in other words, a datum for rivers and lakes, none of those are really true. So we're left with to indicate the shoreline where there's a large tidal fluctuation. There is a good discussion on this in Bowditch in the tide and tidal current section. It talks about all these different types of waters. It gives a nice little diagram based on the charted depth versus what happens in different times. For question number 12, it says high clouds composed of small white flakes or scaly globular masses are often banded together to form what's called mackerel sky. It would be classified as what type of cloud? Well, um, we'll take a look at clouds anyway here, but high clouds just in general means it's a zero type of cloud. So you can rule out answer number A. Um, but just an interesting tidbit, mackerel sky, there's one of those old sailor sayings, which is mackerel sky and mare's tails make tall ships carry short sails. So mackerel sky is kind of an indicator of poor weather coming in a day or so. So you might want to shorten sail when you're doing that. But to answer this question, I would take a look at our friend uh, Bowditch there. And in the glossary, they actually have an entry for mackerel sky. It's an area of sky with a formation of rounded and isolated cirrocumulus or alto cumulus resembling the pattern of scales on the back of a mackerel. So you'll have to get your own fish to take a look at that, but uh, we're looking at like a scaly, so, uh, scaly sky in that case. And here they talk specifically about cirrocumulus. The other thing that is a clue in the question is um, globular masses. So cumulus clouds are these uh, puffy ones, right? And so the combination of the high clouds, the globular masses, and the mackerel sky should guide you to a serocumulus answer. <laughs>